Hey everybody, it's me, John Lorden, and I'm back with Brain Scratch, and this is actually our third episode going into the mysterious case of Elisa Lamb. And if you haven't seen the first two, please check those out. The first one is kind of an overall summary and some ideas about um, what might or might be going on with the case. The second, we dive into the autopsy report and talk about some inconsistencies in terms of how that was put together and the information that kind of shook out around that. And in this one, I wanted to spend some time um, on the video. And I did a lot of research looking into um, some issues that appear to exist with the footage of her in the elevator, which we showed a little bit of in the first episode. But um, if you want to see it for yourself, there are plenty of people that have posted it on YouTube. Just do a quick search for Elisa Lamb elevator video, and I'm sure you'll come up with um, the full at least many options for the full uh, three to four minute video. So, um, real quick, we're starting here at uh, CTV News in Canada, and they had a few nice timelines about kind of the events and how they unfolded. This is a real simple timeline, but this is just back in 2013. January 26th is when Elisa traveled to California. She initially wound up in San Diego and spent some time there and then had a bit of an impromptu stop in Los Angeles and that's where she decided to stay at the Cecil Hotel. Um, on January 31st, that's when she was last seen at the hotel. I believe she was also seen at a place called The Last Bookstore. Um, and her family notes that um, she that she didn't contact them that day, and that's very strange because she was in contact with them daily up until that point. Uh, on February 1st, Lamb was recorded acting strangely in the hotel elevator, and that's kind of one of the issues. I'm not quite sure how they determined for certain that that was February 1st instead of um, January 31st, but we'll get into that a bit later. And on February 1st, she was also due to check out of the hotel that day, but she never showed up to do so. February 6th, LAPD holds a press conference about her disappearance and her family attended that press conference. And then on February, actually there's a step missing in there, on February 14th or the 15th, I believe, the LAPD released the actual elevator video. And then five days later, on February 19th, they found her body, um, employees found her body in the water tank, and the police were on the case. So that's just kind of a quick overview, overview of the timeline. And the first thing I want to talk about in terms of the video is this. That is supposedly the time code or the time stamp that is part of the security camera system. And there's a few things that are at play here. First of all, that is a mess. And the purpose of time codes, quite specifically, um, the importance of time stamping, as noted here at 2mcctv.com, which is all about closed caption television and why you do this kind of stuff, is in case you need to use it in a court of law. And as a matter of fact, pieces of video have been thrown out of court because the timestamp wasn't properly adjusted. So it really strikes me as extremely odd that the timestamp is so damaged and muddled up down here. Now, what could have potentially happened, I'm thinking, is the Cecil Hotel is an old hotel. Perhaps they're using an old video system in there and maybe videotape was converted digitally to this format and in that process this font got funked up but this is my guts telling me it's more than that this is seriously seriously messed up i had to dig hard and find several different sources of people that tried to make sense out of this time code and essentially what you can do is you can watch it played back and you know that certain numbers have to be happening in a certain sequence because numbers happen that way and you're kind of able to determine 
when they roll over, like for the next minute. So there are people that have done in, in depth analysis to try to figure out what time is exactly being stated here. However, even they can't come to a final conclusion. They basically have it down to a couple of time frames. Either this is showing minutes leading up to midnight, like literally, I think from 11.55 to midnight, or it's showing time leading up to eight in the morning, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, basically the conclusion people are coming to is this is leading up right until midnight, which makes sense in terms of what I was talking about with um, February 1st being the last time that she's seen because uh, that appears to be what's on camera here. Um, this link, I'll actually put this link in the description of this video. Uh, this is an analysis done by Cody Fry, and he spent a lot of time also trying to figure out what happened with this footage, because if you look at the timestamp and how quick the seconds are going by, you'll notice that it's the video has been slowed down. Um, which is extremely strange because part of what a lot of people mention when they're viewing the Elisa, the Elisa Lam video is how odd her behavior seems. And if you slow down anyone's motion, it will make most people look odd. As a matter of fact, what Cody has done on this video is he has sped it back up to real time so you can see precisely how she was acting, how quick those motions are when she's flipping her hand and, and doing some of the things that people don't understand. They're very fast motions, where in the other video that was released, they look a bit stranger because of how prolonged the period of time is. So, um, outside of that, analysts of that time code have noticed that there seems to be almost a full minute missing. And does it make sense that someone was releasing this to show it covering four minutes, they cut one of those minutes out, and then they tried to stretch it to refill the four minutes? I don't know. It's possible. Who would do that? I have no idea. Would that be the police trying to manipulate the public, or would that be someone at the hotel trying to manipulate the police? I don't know. But in any case, this timestamp is a joke. That, that doesn't work. And there are people that are thinking, oh, well, it's probably some kind of coded thing and there's a button the police can hit and it just shows them what the time is. No. If you were going to encode video, I, I know a bit about technology. If you were trying to timestamp video, you wouldn't put it on the actual image like this. There are other sections of the data, even in videotape, you put it in the soundtrack portion where you, you wouldn't muddle up potential footage that you need for seeing a culprit or whatever you have this camera for. So this timestamp points to very strange things going on with this footage. So thanks to Cody Fry for his work on that. Um, and here, this website goes into it very deeply and this guy really lets his imagination run in terms of theory all over this case and what could have possibly happened. But, um, and this is at tribewatch.com. If nothing happened in the 24th minute, for example, if Elisa did not return to the camera's view, the police would have not removed the 24th minute. Or if Elisa returned to the camera view in the 24th minute, minute while there was nothing important about it, they would not have removed the 24th minute. Did they at least show the parents a 24th minute? Or perhaps there was never a 24th minute if the camera shut off due to lack of activity. Which I also find strange. There's a theory that people have that maybe the video recorder only kicks on when it sees motion, like it's motion activated. I used to manage stores. We used video recording systems. They did not work like that. It would run all the time. Video systems are put in a loop. There is essentially um, you know, a 30-day, usually, loop where the tape will start overriding itself at the end. So why are you worried about tape consumption? You're, you're not gonna keep all these tapes forever. So having a motion activated video system inside a commercial structure like a hotel really makes no sense. Um, what is curious about this is this person makes a very good point. Why would they have removed that minute? They show in the footage that is there the, the elevator going to floors and just the door opening over and over, which obviously has no importance on the case whatsoever. So at least the appearance of the video being released complete 
seems to have been attempted because they show all this ancillary footage that doesn't need to be there. Quite honestly, why didn't the police edit it and say, here is the 30 seconds that we have of Elisa in the elevator or the minute that we have of Elisa in the elevator acting strange and trim the rest of it off? Something is very, the mentality of how that video is put together and released in its entirety, but not quite entire, is very, very odd. So you can check out tribewatch.com. Like I said, this guy goes all over the place and he really lets his imagination run in terms of theory. But if you're interested in this and really want to try to find the truth, that's the only thing that we can do is really explore these theories and try to rule them out one by one. And whatever's left, as Sherlock Holmes said, no matter how little sense it makes, that's probably going to be the truth. Um, quick shout out, actually, to several commenters. WZ Tutor, I hope you're doing well. Um, I've had a lot of people contribute a lot of very useful information on this case and send additional links, stuff that I haven't bumped into yet. And I just wanted to give a, give a quick shout out to Cindy Y, who sent me a very good website called BodyLanguageSuccess.com. And they actually did an analysis of the Elisa Lamb video pretty close to when it happened. They did their analysis back in 2013. Um, several of the things that they note when Miss Lamb initially enters the elevator, she is not in fear, which even on my original video, I kind of noted that she seems to have this playfulness that's going on. Um, her arm, her wide arm swing and relaxed and fluid gait indicate she is relaxed and thus not feeling urgency. After pushing multiple buttons, she moves to the back left corner of the elevator, her arms at her sides, and feet positions are neutral, relaxed, and not indicating fear. That's right after that she does the quick look out the door where she looks left and looks right. She then retreats to the left wall of the elevator, moves into the left corner, and her hands adopt the fig leaf configuration, and her feet are close together. This is consistent with anxiety, a lower confidence, beta emotional tone, the body language does not by itself indicate fear. So once again, maybe she was playing with someone, maybe there was someone else there that she was trying to scare once they got in the elevator or something like that. Miss Lamb jumps out of the elevator. It's a quick two-step maneuver and is, has a playful quality to it. Once again, it seems like she's playing. For a second or two, Miss Lamb's feet splay wide while her hands are still in the fig leaf nonverbal. This wide stance signifies greater confidence and is not consistent with fear. Thus, the simultaneity, I can't even say that word, simultaneity of these two nonverbals signals some level of emotional dissonance. This is the most important image of the series. For about 16 seconds, Miss Lamb displays an elbows out laterally with armpit exposed and behind the head hair preening display. This was, at least for some time, performed bilaterally. The movement, as she reaches up to begin this extended preen, was fluid, slow, and deliberate, which is very important. This display cluster context is a strong and highly reliable indicator of sexual interest. Once again, I have this feeling that like if she had a guy that she was met at the bar or something that night, there's some playfulness going on here. Uh, the person of her interest is either present outside the elevator or she is actively thinking about this person. My gut keeps leaning towards there being someone outside the elevator. Some people even speculate that you can see an extra foot in some of the footage. It's really hard to tell. You know, all of a sudden a black pixel or two is on the screen. It's only there for you know a piece of a second. I really don't feel like it's hard enough evidence to say that there's another person in the footage, but I do have a feeling that there was another person in the hallway. Um, here we can see both hands and arms retracting from her extended preening sexual display as she turns to go back to the elevator. You can see she's once again up touching her head. She steadies herself as she walks back in the elevator. 
This coupled with her slow gait suggests either lightheaded symptoms, vertigo, or a relative emotional extreme. Um, there have been some people that think she might have been given some kind of date rape drug. There was even a supposed ecstasy expert that took a look at the footage. Um, and they say it's possible, but the with her winding up in the water tank thing does not seem very likely if she was on a party drug, unless she was led there by somebody. Um, the other thing to note is they keep talking about the timing of these displays, and I don't know if this website was aware that the video had been slowed down, as we pretty much are certain of now with the uh, video that Cody Fry did. This elbow forward bilateral hair adjustment behind the ears is a nonverbal sign of Miss Lamb dialing up her alpha. This manipulator adapter pacifier indicates she is trying to be more assertive or courageous. This is in distinction to the sexual display noted above. Notice her elbows are not pointed out laterally but held closer to her body. So she's trying to be strong. Once again, fits into the context. If you've read through her posts, if you've read through her Tumblr, this is, she's a very smart girl but had some confidence issues, and if she was there with someone, a supposed date or something like that, I could see her slipping into these modes of trying to build herself back up before she's about to encounter him again, which is about to happen. Although the resolution is low, we can see that Ms. Lamb is smiling, although it might not be a true sincere smile, it is at least a fair social smile. Her right hand gestures in an illustrator with a fingertip only touching of her right chest, this hand illustrator suggests a lower sincerity or a higher level of anxiety in this moment. Once again, that could all point to her being nervous about meeting someone. Remember, she had social anxieties. I mean, she was very clear about that. Um, this is where we get into her arms really flailing around. A series of fairly dramatic nonverbal illustrators um, takes place later in the video. This may be part of the body language of a conversation taking place with someone who is out of view, or perhaps is sort of a rehearsal for an anticipated upcoming conversation interaction, or as many have speculated, possibly could be due to narcotics. It almost looks at one point, according to them, like she's playing a game of charades in this shot. Um, in this image, her right foot goes up on her toes. She does this several times. This is body language pattern that indicates a significant level of excitement and optimism, also common with joy. At the very end of this video, her elbow briefly elevates up and out laterally again in a shorter repeat of the sexual interest preening. In conclusion, they feel like Miss Elisa Lamb is playing a game of hide-and-seek or something similar in this video. And although at times she plays some anxiety, there is no indication of fear. There's definitely an element of play present here. It is, of course, possible that narcotics are influencing her behavior. Of particular importance is she's putting herself on sexual display. While what is seen here may have no connection with her demise, if the events in this video occurred just before her disappearance, it strongly suggests that the person to whom she is attracted may have knowledge of, contributed to, or be responsible for her death. Another point I want to make here, I did not realize until I did this research that she was actually on the 14th floor when the elevator was capturing all this. For some reason in my mind, I just assumed that she was in the lobby trying to either get away for someone, from someone or go up to her floor. But apparently she was on 14 and hitting b levels that were below her. Um, some people also note that in the sequence of buttons she's pressing, she's actually hitting the door open button last. So she's actually asking the elevator to keep its door open. And the doors seem to stay open for a period of two minutes, which some people have confirmed um, is actually true for that specific elevator. If you hit the door open button, you can sit there with a timer and apparently the doors will stay open for two minutes. Um, this is her sister Sarah's Twitter account. And once again, you know, I try to not go into like the MK Ultra Illuminati type theories around this. But the social media has always hit me very strange in this case. And if you take a look at Sarah, um, Sarah's Twitter account here, 
she only has ten tweets. And I think three of them are about Elisa around the time of her disappearance. She's even asking for help from the Young Turks at one point in terms of finding her sister. What is curious to me is that's it. I mean, there's only, there's only ten here. A shot of her sister with the glasses, talking about when she was last seen, thanking someone for them sending her good wishes. Um... Seriously, there is only four tweets before she's talking about Elisa, and the rest are about Elisa, and then it just stops. And for trying to engage Twitter, I mean, I understand she didn't have a whole lot of followers. Um, I was new to Twitter once, and I felt like I could contact the whole world. Why did she only reach out to the Young Turks as a major media organization? Why didn't she reach out to every, you know, Los Angeles-based news firm that she could, um... There's just there's so much more that could have been done with Twitter, and what I find also strange about this um, is there's a link here to her Facebook account, and here's her Facebook account, and her Facebook posts, at least from what I can see, because I'm not a user of Facebook, so I can't log into it, but it does seem to be showing her her whole feed to me. Um, her Facebook account doesn't mention Elisa at all, even around the time of her disappearance. What's stranger, and once again, I keep saying, I'm, I'm really trying not to go into crazy, you know, there's a code being issued to the Illuminati through this instance. What's stranger is this. There's actually a post from her about doing um, some work at a place called the Cecil Green Park House, and this was posted literally three days before... Elisa disappeared. Just really, really odd to me. There's been a lot of weird name connections. If you want to see more of those, watch my first video. Um, and like I said, I'm really, I'm trying to keep this real world. I'm trying to stay very logical about it, but I can't help but notice there are very odd things here. Also, her picture isn't on here anywhere. Uh, I believe that these are a model. That's not her. If if that's supposedly her, then that is definitely not the same Sarah Lamb that is in the police um, footage where um, Lieutenant uh, Teague is talking with her family. Um, the main profile pic on here is this person. And once again, as I noted in my first video, um, Elisa's own social media almost includes no pictures of her herself. As a matter of fact, I think still to this day, I've only seen maybe four pictures of Elisa, and they're the same pictures that we've all seen that keep getting recirculated with every news story and every video that comes out about her. There doesn't seem to be... The, the social media profiles just hit me odd, and Sarah's falls right back into that pocket. Um, now, Sarah's seems to have gone on, I think the last update in there is in 2014, but even her Facebook has kind of tapered off at that point. I've also heard from commenters on my other videos that um, that Corduroy magazine that I was talking about, supposedly that website is now gone. And something I haven't talked about yet is there was actually some type of company called the Invisible Light Agency, and for a while their address was showing up as being the Cecil Hotel. Uh, another person actually got some screenshots of their website. Their website is no longer active, but it's weird because if you go there, you know how you go to a placeholder for a website and they say this domain's for sale, but they have links that they think are related? Well, the number one link is the Cecil Hotel. So there's something strange about that, the Invisible Light Agency. As a matter of fact, I was curious what Cecil means. So I did a quick search on it. And the meaning for Cecil is blind. Invisible Light Agency, Cecil Hotel... I don't know. I don't know. Do I think this is some kind of weird conspiracy where they're trying to get out code words to people? No. But like I said, I can't help but notice there are very bizarre trends that keep going on around this. Also worth noting, the name Cecil is now a popular baby name that is literally exploding in popularity over the past few years. Very, very odd. Um, all right, so this might be my last point on it. After sitting with all this, realizing that, first of all, the time code has been tampered with in terms of its look, 
the speed of the video has been tampered with, there's been editing that's been done to it. Some people are even saying that there's repeat frames that are happening in certain sections of the video. My brain keeps going around, why did the police release that video? And some people even ask, why did Elisa get so much attention when she was just a missing person? There's 3,000 people that go missing in Los Angeles every single year. So what, what was so special about Elisa Lam? The police have actually commented specifically because it was an international case that they thought it was important to, to bring the media in on it. Um, but my brain keeps going about why was that surveillance footage released? It was not great footage of her. I mean, quite honestly, you could use a body double and reshoot that footage and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference from one person to the next with how pixelated it is. And usually closed caption footage is released for a specific reason, like it shows a perpetrator that they can't identify or it shows a person going off in a direction where they're not sure where they went. There's usually a very clear-cut reason why the police issue this type of footage. As a matter of fact, to try to test that, I did a search on police release footage in Google, and I just wanted to see what came up, and I looked through a few pages of it, and in every single case, you can tell specifically why the footage was released. Nowadays, there's a lot of footage being released by police because they're trying to show another side to a tragic event, like a shooting that they had done or something. All of a sudden, they'll release their police footage and say, look, this is how the event happened from the cop's camera. Um, but there's missing person cases, There's, and that's when I bumped into this, which is dated only a few weeks ago. Police released CCTV footage of missing man, and supposedly this is a Chinese man that went missing in Belfast. First of all, have you heard about this guy at all? Nope. This website, this isn't a big site, this isn't CNN or Fox or one of those, this is U.TV. Um, so the excuse about Elisa getting so much attention because she was international isn't quite holding up to me, at least in this case. I mean, yes, admittedly, this is, this is a, about a story that's in the UK, but still, um, Elisa's story went viral internationally. And it was already getting plenty, plenty of press coverage before the actual elevator footage was released. That just kicked it into a whole different realm. But if you look at the history of it, most major news organizations were reporting on her missing. Um, but once again, in every instance on this Google search, I can see where it made sense. Like in this guy's case, they have footage of him in the street somewhere and he's going off down a different avenue that could be helpful to someone that in particular knows the area, knows where he might have been headed to. That elevator footage of Elisa, what good is it? What, what exactly does it do? What, how would it have helped the police? What kind of knowledge could the public have given the police that they didn't already have from seeing that footage of her in an elevator? She was in the hotel. They already know she was in the hotel. It told them at least what floor she was on, which once again calls to the fact that there was probably someone else involved. Why did they release that clip? It was the only hotel, or it was the only elevator in the hotel, so there was obviously footage of her taking it up to the 14th floor. We didn't get that. So, and why was this video manipulated? Why is the timestamp so damaged? It's very, very odd. I really. I'm kind of unsettled with it even more now, um, realizing that there has been some level of hijinks being played on this video. Like I said, I can't say it's the police department trying to fool the public. It could be someone at the hotel trying to fool the police. But somewhere along this chain, this video got really messed up. And what I want to leave you with is, in its final form, why was it produced this way? Why was it released showing the elevator mysteriously going to other floors? The story that's being told in this video is very clear. You can believe one of a few things. You can believe that the elevator is malfunctioning in some supernatural way, or this girl is tripping on drugs, um, or you can try to be a bit 
more logically minded and try to get to the conclusions that all these internet sleuths and myself are trying to do, which is this is a girl that maybe had some interesting physical motions, but they kind of make sense if you put the context of there being someone else there, particularly someone that she was romantically interested in there. So, it's strange. Every video I do here I, on this case, I kind of leave with this weirder feeling about it. But something about this video is telling me not to trust its intent. The way that it's released. Why is there all that extra footage at the end of it, of the elevator doors just opening and closing? Um, is it produced? Is this invisible light agency somewhat responsible for this in some way? It's even possible that, like I suggested before, it could possibly be a body double. But why? Why would someone go to all that? There's, there's even a theory out there that Perhaps someone approached Elisa and made her think that she was taking partaking in some type of TV show or reenacting scenes from one of her favorite movies. And if you look at the analysis that we did um, earlier, there is some credence to the theory that she was acting, that she was playing, that she was doing charades, playing hide and seek, that she was in a very playful spirit. So. Very odd. Um, I look forward to your comments. Please keep them coming. Please shoot me more links to more information. Give me more thoughts on this. Um, but as I'm sitting with it right now, this feels to me like there is some type, something's being covered up in particular with that video. That missing minute might be the magic bullet. Um, maybe it shows someone walking by. Maybe it shows someone of authority walking by. I have no idea. Maybe it shows a hotel employee walking by. I don't know. But for some reason, that video was manipulated in some way. And I feel like we're being manipulated in a big way. And that doesn't make me feel good at all. So thank you so much for checking this out. I hope it stirs up some thoughts or feelings within you and you do a little of your own research on this. And whatever you find, please um, come back here, drop a comment to me and let me know. There are so many people interested in what happened to Elisa. There are still new stories being written on this. I saw one as recent as December 2014. Um, the public is not happy. We're really not happy with what has happened here, and we're not going to let it go. As a matter of fact, I even found the email address for the agent of uh, Jeremy Lovering, who is the guy that's going to be directing The Bringing, which is the Sony film based on Elisa Lam. And I basically asked his agent to please forward the email to him, if at all possible. And in the email, I'm asking him all these questions about, look, man, this was a botched investigation. I know you guys want to make a supernatural movie and have fun with that. But please do the right thing and use the attention that you're going to get around this case as a springboard for hope, hopefully helping the truth come out. If that means reopening this investigation... Um, possibly with another department to, to try to find out. I mean, it's weird. I'm back to where I was in the first video. This could have some type of cover-up that's going on within the LAPD. Maybe not that, you know, the LAPD murdered Elisa Lam, but maybe that they didn't handle the case right and they're trying to make sure that their boots don't look too dirty. I don't know. I don't know. It's very, very, very odd. Um, anyway... I wish you all health and happiness, and I will catch you on the next Brain Scratch. Take care.